Welcome everyone to the Sidrail Podcast, your forward operation space for all things military and historical wargaming. I am your host, Ariskany Jim, and today we are looking at a conflict that perhaps doesn't get enough attention in the wargaming community, the First Indochina War, or French Indochina War, fought between 1946 and 1954. Specifically, we're looking at part of the Battle of Vinyen, fought from 13 to 17 January 1951 using Mark Ritchie's tactical combat system in 15mm. The Battle of Vinyen was the first major open field engagement between the Viet Minh and the French, making it to the French Indochina War kind of what the Battle of Ai Drang and Operation Silver Bayonet would be to the Second Indochina War a little bit later, more commonly known of course as the Vietnam War. Here are just some of the similarities. At the Battle of Vinyen, the two sides would really come to grips with each other for the first time. The French would initially lose some of their outer positions overrun by the Viet Minh. The French would eventually win the Battle of Vinyen, mostly through the use of large-scale artillery and airstrikes, and no small degree of French tenacity. But, like the Americans at Ai Drang, the French would learn all the wrong lessons from their victory at Vinyen eventually leading to their ultimate defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Now to our American audience, the Vietnam War is of course known all too well, and there's a general acknowledgement that the French lost a war here previously. But if you really sit down to the geostrategic chessboard, this conflict daisy chains all the way back to the fall of France in May and June of 1940. Now, of course, as we all know, France goes down hard in this invasion, but Germany leaves about a third of the country still standing in what they call the Vichy regime. This is so the German foreign ministry can sort of puppet string control French colonies all around the world. This strategy doesn't entirely work, though, because some of the colonies remain loyal to the free French government, some to the Vichy government, leading to all kinds of conflicts I won't get into here. But one of the colonies that remains loyal to the Vichy regime is French Indochina, a colony that comprises modern-day Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Germany arranges for French Indochina to more or less be given over to the Japanese in the winter of 1940 and 41. The Germans are trying to get Japan signed on to their big invasion of the Soviet Union they have planned for later that summer. So the Japanese occupy what we more or less call today Vietnam, where there's a young communist activist called Ho Chi Minh. To fight the Japanese, he gets a lot of help from the OSS, or the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of what we call today the CIA. So yeah, that's right, Ho Chi Minh got his big start fighting for Uncle Sam. So the Japanese surrender, the war is over, and the French want all their colonies back. The Americans are reluctant, but we want the French to sign on board with the newly founded NATO and to stand with us against the Soviets. So reluctantly, the United States underwrites the French recolonization of Indochina. So Ho Chi Minh is betrayed and he goes to war with the French in 1946. There's a lot of guerrilla action and insurgency, but like we said, it's not until Vin Yen that we see the first big ring the bell, knock him down, drag him out fight in January 1951. By now, the French are screaming for American support, but remember the dates. This is 1950-1951. The Americans are already involved in a major land war in Asia, in Korea. We're already fighting the Chinese there, and if we help the French too much in Vietnam, it's a very good chance that the Chinese can get involved there too, and voila, you're now fighting two Korean wars at the same time. No thank you. Now, you will see a lot of American gear on the French side. This is basically the Free French Army of late World War II. So, M24 Chaffees, all kinds of different Amtraks, the Jeeps, the trucks, F6F Hellcats left over from the Pacific War, all the machine guns, tons of 50 cals, even down to their camouflage. It's the old green pattern frog skin that you saw the U.S. Marine Corps wear throughout the Pacific War. The French general is the famous and very capable Jean de Latre of World War II fame. His objective is to try to get the Viet Minh to come out of the jungle and engage them in open, large-scale battle. Stop me when this starts sounding familiar. As for the communists, General Giap is trying to cut the Route 2 highway about 30 miles northwest of Hanoi leading into the capital. That's my target for the game. That's right, I'm playing the communists again and Mark himself is playing the French. Let's go to the footage and see who prevails. Here is our table for today's game. It measures 6 feet by 6 feet, which is a little smaller than we usually play on, but we're still in 15 millimeter. We're looking out of the south into the north. And along the bottom half of your screen there, you can clearly see the Route 2 highway that leads into Hanoi. 
So figure Hanoi is about 20 to 30 miles off of the lower right corner of your screen. Over here on the left side of the table, we see the village, which is going to be my targeted objective, as commander of the lead elements of the 312th Viet Minh Division. We see where Mark already has some of his French set up, looks like he's got a mortar crew there, and an M24 Chaffee light tank. This was an American designed light tank developed at the very end of World War II to replace the M5 Stuart. And it looks like Mark also has some of his infantry set up here at the forward end of this rice paddy as a forward line of defense. Here on turn one, we see the beginnings of my initial attack. It's not the most tactically scientific approach, but with no cover, I don't really have much of a choice. One thing I am doing, however, is I'm keeping all of my leaders in the back with my support weapons. Now, we do know that that flag is an NLF or a Viet Cong flag. Mark and I invite you to please lodge your complaints at www.itsjustagame.com. But in all seriousness, you see where, again, all of my leaders are back here with what few support weapons I have. I do have a lot of reinforcements coming and a lot more support weapon options coming. Right now, I really just have one mortar and a collection of old World War one that looks like a Hotchkiss uh, old French colonial machine gun and a couple of light machine guns. I'm doing the best I can to provide my assault with at least some kind of cover. Here comes some of that cover fire. I've got two medium machine guns, three shots apiece. They need sevens to hit. So that's one hit so far. Here comes another Hotchkiss firing from this position. Again, three shots. I need sevens to hit on T20s. And, okay, those all crapped out on me. Alright, so that's one hit so far. Now I've got two light machine guns. Same number of shots, but now I have to go down to sixes to hit. I'll just go ahead and roll both of them at once. And with sixes to hit, looks like I scored two more. Okay, so these two plus the one from the immediate machine gun means I got three total hits. Let me go to roll for their effects. Low is better. All right, so three is an outright kill, and then two light wounds applied against those French infantry along the front of those rice paddies. Of course, I'm taking plenty of counterfire back. As we can see, Mark is missing with many of his shots, but when he rolls for the effect, oof, every time he does score a hit, it's always lethal. So this is my fourth man down, while Mark has only lost one. It's not looking good so far for Uncle Ho. Speaking of not looking good, let's take a preview of some of the French reinforcements. We've got some aircraft waiting in the wings, although Mark has to roll for those. Those might not ever show up. We've got some American-made M24 Chaffee light tanks, lots more infantry, and these up-armored gun trucks with more machine guns than the law should allow. Those things are positively bristling. We also have some of these weasels. These are very small, late war American made amphibious vehicles now making an appearance in French Indochina. Is it too late to mention that my assault force is predominantly armed with Japanese Arasaka World War II era rifles? They were actually pretty bad even for World War II and here they are in French Indochina. Meanwhile, Mark is bringing in some more of his reinforcements and deploying more of his infantry. These three brick buildings here in the center of your screen, these are my actual objectives. Of course, they still have roofs, but we've taken them off for now, just so you can see how the guys are deployed inside. One of Mark's new Amtraks with a 75mm assault howitzer with all its penalties needs a 3 to hit on a D20, and of course he does. So, yep, that's going to be a direct hit on my medium machine gun team hidden in that tree line. So then we roll the effects, and it looks like the machine gun itself has been destroyed. I've got two kills among the three-man crew, and the third man is lightly wounded. So there goes half my base of fire. By the end of turn two, things aren't looking so good. It looks like I've crossed about half the distance to the rice paddies, but I'm not trying to reach the rice paddies. I have to reach those buildings beyond the rice paddies. I'm sort of doing a pickets charge type maneuver where half of my assault is doing a series of obliques to try and focus on the objective, but yeah, again, I'm taking way too many losses. I'm trying to cut down on those with use of my mortar, which just dropped a white phosphorus smoke screen in front of these two Amtraks, because they're just doing way too much damage. Speaking of damage, yeah, here's the kill ratio so far. I've lost 17 figures here, plus a machine gun, he's lost one. So as far as any kind of collateral measure or manpower measure, I'm definitely not doing well so far, and I need some reinforcements. On turn three, I do get two more 82mm mortars, and it's time for a change in plan, because these smoke screens are just not protecting my assault. When Mark halts in order to open fire on me, his Amtraks do become vulnerable to being physically struck by my mortars. So I've hit that mortar, then I roll my damage check, you see I got a 5 there, a nice low roll. 
which in this case indicates a complete explosion in that Amtrak. That's all four crew members killed, that machine gun knocked out, and one less armored vehicle to deal with. My other two mortar shells missed, and then we have to roll scatter. So the D8 that you see there, the double fives, indicate the direction of the scatter. And I thought I was doing pretty well there, because five means that even my misses go right back on those objective buildings. So sweet, even when I miss, I hit. But then for damage effect, I roll double twenties, which is the worst roll you can possibly get twice. So on those two scatters, out of 400 possible results, I get the very worst one. I mean, they were misses, so I'm not too upset, and I did flame that amp track, so good to go. With no actual anti-tank weapons on the table yet, I am getting some in future turns, but I don't have them yet. I'm doing the best I can with my three 82mm mortars. So there's mortar number one, mortar number two, and here's 82mm mortar number three. Notice they are all within 16 centimeters of a liter. This is an old Valor and Victory trick. Always put your onboard mortars next to your leaders. It will pay off big time. I have dropped another 82mm HE round directly on the roof of an open top amp track, and you see the results. Hitting them is actually pretty difficult. I think I need a 5 on a D20, but with a leader that goes up to a 6 or a 7, which is, you know, a 7 is almost a 50% increase. And once it lands on there, the very thin skinned, open topped. Long story short, take your first shot. 82mm white phosphorus round, scratch another amp track. It's Christmas time in Kami land, and by that I mean Ho Chi Minh has finally sent us some reinforcements, including some <gasps> shock horror actual anti-tank weapons. I know, amazing concept. So the first ones I have are these three bazookas you see staged here at the back of the second wave infantry force. This isn't their position, this is just us getting them kind of set out and laid out. So they're going to be out of range at first, they won't get to shoot right away, they are going to be coming on the table with the infantry and shooting later. I have some 57mm recoilless rifles, apologies that that one there isn't painted, the one that was prepared broke and this one here is just kind of filling in for now, but behind it you see some douchkas. I've got two douchkas here, they had a grand total of six shots, and with my dice being my dice, five of them missed. Uh, both of my recoilless rifles also missed, because of course they did. But one of them, they were both shooting at that chaffee there, you see at the center of your screen. One of them did miss and hit that brick building behind it, and damaged the building and killed two Frenchmen in there, so at least that's something. So as my anti-tank weapons continue to miss, my MVPs are still my 82mm mortars. So I hit this truck twice, it's a good thing I hit it twice because my first damage check was another 20, because of course it was. But that's alright, the second damage check was more solid, and kaboom, there goes the gun truck. My third mortar lands next to this Bernard armored car, lightly wounds one of the crewmen, and kills another Frenchman that was outside the armored car behind that pagoda building nearby. Meanwhile, French counterfire comes back at my tree line and knocks out one of my 57mm recoilless rifles. He got exactly one shot on the table and then was immediately destroyed after missing with his one shot. Now we picked that specific gun position to eliminate just because he was frankly an unpainted miniature. And if there is anything on this table that has a short life expectancy, long story short, take your second shot, it is an unpainted or poorly painted miniature. You are marked for death, my friend, and that's what you get for being an ugly duckling. Starting on turn 6, and we have another salvo from my anti-tank weapons, and apparently my guys have finally put their glasses on because they score a nice hit with a 3, which hits and blows up that chaffee you see there behind that rice paddy. Now there were some extra steps I did have to go through there. Number 1, I had to hit the tank despite its hull down shielding. Now normally that's a 14 up in order to hit the turret and not the hull down shielding. Here I'm shooting at hull down shielding from an elevated position so it goes down to a 7 but you saw I beat it with a 15. And then I score a 6 with my damage. I subtract 1 from that because of my firepower versus the tank's armor and we see the results. That is going to be the end of that chaffee. Here are all the hits from my 50 cals, so I start off on a 9, make that a 10 because of elevated position. Now again, I have that plus 2 leader, so I need a 12. You see where I got 5 out of 6 hits, so my dice are definitely starting to warm up again, and I have chewed up plenty of infantry there in those rice paddies. Meanwhile, Mark is taking some return fire and scoring some hits, and it looks like he's killed one of the crewmen on one of my douchkas. 
Later on in the movement phase, my three bazookas have moved forward and are barely in range. I was trying to get a flank shot on that chaffee you see there, but because of the burning Amtrak and a slight angle difference, I was just not going to get it. So I'm going to have to settle for a shot on the front armor of that small French armored car you saw a second ago. I have a 5 chance to hit, plus 1 for my leader, negative 1 because the Pernard is considered a small target. So 3 chances for 3 bazookas, and a 3, a 6, and a 7. I did score 1 hit. Awesome. So now we're talking about the uh, armor piercing round of a bazooka uh, against the armored car. Kaboom. Yeah, long story short, take your third shot, it doesn't last very long. One of my misses went straight down that alley and killed somebody at the other end of the alley. And another one hit that brick building, did some more damage, and actually killed some guys in the building. Now that armored car didn't exactly explode catastrophically, it just sort of flamed out into a charred wreck. And what that means is that that crew will have a chance to escape. So you do see Mark putting some more figures on the table, and they will now join the battle basically as light infantry. Mark has dropped a mortar on my bazooka team. Apparently he takes issue with me lobbing anti-tank rockets at him. Killed my leader and two of my bazooka gunners. Now those bazookas are still there. The men are dead, but the bazookas are still intact. There's a role for that in this game. When you kill a trooper carrying a special weapon, the weapon itself might survive. So I'm going to send some guys back, pick up those bazookas, and continue the attack. Meanwhile, I'm dropping more mortars on more gun trucks. That's what happens when you carry in more machine guns than the law should allow. By the next turn, those two dropped bazookas have been retrieved by new soldiers who have fired two new rockets. Unfortunately, we missed this chaffee that is parked right in front of my objective. One of the misses went way off in the rice paddy there, but the other one hit this pagoda building. And then I rolled four or less on my d20 damage check, and kaboom, the building actually collapses. There are rules for that in this game, and that kills everybody inside the building. There were three French riflemen in there. Unfortunately, they were already dead by small arms fire, so I didn't get any free kills, but hey, they're dead nevertheless. Later on in the turn, those three bazooka gunners have all been killed a second time, and now I have no one nearby to retrieve those weapons and keep up the fire. All three weapons are still intact, I just have no one that can get to them. Speaking of keeping weapons screwed, I am playing friggin' musical chairs here, shuttling guys further and further down, left down my line, to keep these weapons up as long as I can. Like right here, you see that little white puffball? That is another white phosphorus round that landed on the crew of one of my 57mm recoilless rifles. Mark's now rolling his effects. Looks like he has scored two kills, and the third man has suffered a light wound. But that's okay, because you see, I already have two more crewmen on their way to that weapon. I knew this was going to happen, and I've got to keep these crew serve support weapons up and running as long as I possibly can. Fortunately, that explosion over my recoilless rifle was simultaneous, so as he was being destroyed, he scored another hit on that chaffee there and destroyed that as well. This is all that's left of my two waves of assault troops. My first wave is completely gone, that's what's left of my second wave, and even one of those rounds is self-inflicted. I was trying to drop mortars on those objective buildings, one of them fell short and wound up wounding my lead guy. So yeah, that's the kind of day I'm having. I was hoping to get at least one guy into the building and then he could die there. We'll honor him as a hero of the Republic and make a postal stamp about him, but I don't even think that's going to happen. And sure enough, here comes the airstrike to finish me off. So this is one part of the game where I've frankly been very lucky. Mark has been trying to roll for this airstrike over and over and over again all through the entire game. He keeps getting just the 105mm offboard howitzer, which, trust me, uh, is bad enough. Here he finally gets the airstrike. This is an F6F Hellcat left over from the Pacific War. It carries six 50 caliber machine guns. Now that does get divided in half because it's an aerial attack platform attacking a ground target, but still that's going to be nine dice of 50 caliber damage. And now Mark is rolling the effects. He got two kills outright, and then he starts uh, rolling a bunch of wounds that start to accumulate on top of each other, and of course also accumulates on the wounds that my guys were already carrying. So, in summary, yeah, that's pretty much the end of my force. Um, <laughs> one airstrike, that was the absolute end of any chance I had of getting in those buildings. 
Okay, just to round out the turn, and quite frankly the game, I'm going to take some parting fire with my recrewed 57mm recoilless rifle here, with a plus 2 liter, I might add, and hopefully kill that chaffy that's been standing in my way all game. Uh, nope, even with a plus 2 liter, an 18 is not going to be a hit on any day of the week. Alright, here come my mortars. If I can't take those objective buildings, I can at least knock them down. Hell no, I can't, because I can't roll to save my ass. Here comes my third mortar. Okay, that one's a hit, because that one had the plus two liter, so he needed a 12 and rolled an 11. Then I rolled a six on my damage check, so that building is now collapsed. It doesn't really affect the outcome, but damn, it sure feels good. All right, so that's going to insta-kill the wounded Frenchman that was already in the building. The two able-bodied Frenchmen have a chance to bail out. I'm gonna roll their effects and subtract three from these results. That 7 becomes a 4, he's dead. That 4 becomes a, a 1, he's also dead. Okay, so with my parting shot, I managed to take out three more Frenchmen. That's the end of the game, and clearly I have lost this one, because I didn't even come close to reaching any of the objective buildings. My high watermark was right here at this burning Amtrak, but the collateral damage suffered by the French has been pretty severe. We've got two Jeeps burning here, we've got a gun truck on, an Amtrak, an armored car, two buildings, two more chaffies are burning in that mass, another gun truck, over here we've got two more jeeps. Yeah, the French may have won the day, but let me tell you something, they know that they have been in a fight. It's almost like the Vietnamese don't want them here in Vietnam. Get the hint, pack up your crepes and go home. And then here are the casualties for the game. Good grief. I mean, even this huge pile of casualties for the Viet Minh isn't completely accurate because I had to use some figures out of my casualty pile to completely flesh out my reinforcement waves. So there are the French casualties. Definitely significant, but nothing near what I suffered as the Viet Minh. All right, guys, what can I say? Your boy Oriskany took a spanking on that one. Then again, I don't think I've taken a complete defeat at that club since late February, so I was definitely overdue for a trip behind the woodshed. That said, uh, and I'm not asking for a rematch, I would be very curious to try that scenario again, taking a different approach. When you're playing forces like the Viet Minh or later on the Viet Cong, you gotta remember a huge part of their playbook is denial of battle. Part of me would almost be interested to see how that game would turn out if I didn't attack on turn one. There's nothing in the scenario conditions that say I have to start advancing on turn one. I can stay in those woods on my side of the table, wait until turn three when my second wave comes on the board along with some decent support options, and then attack all at once. Not a single man among my first wave even came close to the objective, so I wouldn't have lost any time effectively. Meanwhile, Mark was commenting at the table that he had calculated he would have to kill at least nine Viet Minh every single turn to even come close to holding the line. So what if I had just denied those first two turns of battle, denied him those first 18 casualties? As the game worked out, I ran out of men just as I was reaching the objective line. What if I still had 18 or more men at that moment? I guess we'll never know. But that's where we're going to leave it for today, folks. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you enjoyed this content, please remember to hit that notification bell. Also, please consider joining the SITREP Podcast Discord. There's an auto-accept invitation link to our Discord in the description of this video. Join our community, see what everybody's up to, and best of all, show us what's happening on your hobby table. But for now, this is Ariskany Jim with the SITREP Podcast. We are rounds complete for another episode, and as always, Tango Mike for watching.